Last time uh, we were here and I uh, was talking to you about the uh, failures and failings of the Jeremy Corbyn project, the Jeremy Corbyn leadership, and why ultimately that fell apart under the weight of the fact that it was principally a project run at the top levels by the by the middle class and by people with very specifically uh, middle class politics. And today I'm going to extend that analysis to look a bit further and in more depth for the kind of people who are is still in and around the Labour Party claiming to carry the torch for the kind of approach that Jeremy Corbyn sought to embody when he was leader of the Labour Party. And that means looking at the people who identify themselves as the avowedly socialist section of the Labour Party because God knows Keir Starmer doesn't want much to do with that word at the moment. So who are the socialists in the Labour Party and what are they doing? Because we hear in the Labour friendly media and amongst people on the left that there's going to be some sort of comeback, that there's going to be another Corbyn type figure is going to step forward and be able to do all the things that Corbyn couldn't. And we've been hearing this for a while now. This talk started even before the disastrous 2019 election defeat. The idea that they were going to have Corbynism without Corbyn was one of the things that was spoken about after the 2017 election. And it's worth looking at this because this is obviously an idea which some people take seriously, which might be something that has a certain echo amongst people who had a fond memory of Corbyn or thought that he was unfairly treated or done over. And so it's worth looking at these people and what do they stand for? What are they doing? So the avowed socialists in the Labour Party allowed largely organised around something called the Socialist Campaign Group. And that's a body that was set up by uh, people like Tony Benn and uh, Dennis Skinner was a very prominent member of it for a long time. And they are the avowedly uh, socialist part of the party. They are the group that Corbyn himself used to belong to before, of course, Keir Starmer kicked him out. And they are the group in which lies uh, people like uh, Rebecca Long-Bailey, who unsuccessfully challenged Starmer for the leadership back in 2020, and Richard Burgeon, who stood for the deputy leadership. And they are apparently the internal opposition to Starmer. And so, as I say, it's worth looking at what these people stand for. Now, a couple of things straight off the bat. As I said in the last video, when looking at the weaknesses of Corbyn and Corbynism, the fact that it was a very middle class project was one of its most fatal weaknesses. And this is reflected also in the socialist campaign group, the kind of people that they're in them and the kind of politics that they embody. They have all the weaknesses of Corbyn and Corbynism with none of the strengths of Corbyn himself. For instance, two examples. Uh, Richard Burgeon at the time of the, uh, the great anti-Semitism lie that was going around about Corbyn and others on the left in the Labour Party who voiced any kind of remotely critical opinion of the state of Israel. Uh, Richard Burgeon was, um, had a smear story run on him in the press uh, saying that he was being anti-Semitic because he'd made some solidarity comments about the Palestinian struggle in the past and unfortunately when what this required was for Burgeon to step forward to say yes I made those comments, yes I stand by them and no, this is to say it's anti-Semitic is a grotesque lie. And instead of doing that, he immediately capitulated, apologised, and of course didn't do any many good. Uh, those who were labelling him falsely as an anti-Semite weren't going to stop. They never did with Corbyn. They're not going to do that with Richard Burgeon either. And of course, he waffled and wavered all over the place. Ended up looking like a bit of a fool and looking very insincere. And it's because fundamentally. Richard Burgeon is from the same very weak school of politics that the rest of the so-called socialists and Labour Party are, which is that he's um, he believes that somehow there can be some sort of middle way found whereby um, people like him can rise somehow to the top of the Labour Party, run, run somehow uh, the British government and find some sort of compromise with British capitalism and the British ruling class. Whereas the Corbyn period made clear that that's such a compromised position is evidently not possible. Certainly the ruling class have made it very clear that they don't regard it as possible. Any challenge to them is greeted with the utmost hostility. 
Um, but people like Burgeon, who probably, let's be fair and say that he does sincerely believe in the things that he advocates for, wants to do so via the methods of the Labour Party as it's always stood. And that gives it, and that and his politics being of a more middle class persuasion gives him all those weaknesses that leads him towards compromising and trying to find some acceptable way to work within the establishment and of course the establishment didn't want anything to do with Corbyn or anyone associated with him they wanted them gone and so no amount of apologizing was ever going to appease people who want to push you out of the political process altogether and so that's Richard Burgeon who ran for deputy leader a man who crumbled instantly under press pressure um, who made no attempt to push back against these vile lies that were told about him and others he never made any attempt either to defend the likes of Chris Williamson, who was victimised and thrown out of the Labour Party in the time of Corbyn's leadership, towards the end of that leadership. Neither did Rebecca Long-Bailey, who ran for the leadership against Keir Starmer. She was another one who was highlighted as this potential great hope for the future, who was going to carry the torch for Corbynism. And she was another one who was tarred with the, uh, again, the vile lies about anti-Semitism. And she reacted in just the same way Burgeon did. Waffled, wavered, tried to apologise, ended up looking like a fool. And again, this is what all these people do. When the ruling class and the political establishment uh, through the media attack them, rather than standing up to it and, say, and appealing to the, um, at the time, the mass base of support that Corbyn and those around him did have, they instead crumbled, didn't provide any leadership, immediately backed down. And that's just in opposition. Can we imagine what these people would do when they were in government, if they ever got into government, when the stakes were really, really high and the ruling class and the political establishment really turned up the pressure? If they can't stand up to the lies of the media, if they can't stick their chins out and say, no, this is a lie, you are a bunch of liars and propagandists and I'm going to prove it and I'm not going to back down to you, they immediately crumble. Those aren't people who you would describe as leadership material under any circumstances, certainly not the kind of people you'd want to be running a government that was meant to be in power in order to actually um, advocate for and fight for the working class, because these people clearly have no fight in them. But it's worth looking at some of the things these people say they stand for, because OK, maybe these are, are weak characters, maybe these are not the best, should we say. Um, personnel but what does the socialist campaign group actually stand for well you can go on their very small website and take a look at it uh, they've got a number of uh, points that they say they stand for and it's worth just reading through a couple of them to see what are the actual demands that they put they are putting forward in the Labour Party now and I'll link to this in the, uh, the description for the video so you can go and see that see it yourself now they say some good things in there about the need for inner party democracy um, and need for what they call open selection, I mean a democratised candidate selection process and I think most of you watching this video would probably agree with that but again let's check, let's check the record what did these people do when they actually had a chance to push for this and when they had a chance through the Corbyn leadership to push for a more democratic selection process for parliamentary candidates they backed down they crumbled they compromised with the Labour Party right wing with the so-called moderates they compromised on the one thing that could have actually given them some leverage against these people which is empowering the membership to remove these heinous bunch of uh, reactionary Labour MPs who never accepted Corbyn's leadership who would never accept the democratic will of the party membership who loathe and detest the trade union movement who loathe and detest the idea of the working class in this country having any actual real power over the political process what did they do when the chance to actually really challenge those MPs came up? Crumbled, compromised with them, gave away the one weapon that they could have used to actually further their cause. So, straight off the bat, straight at the top of the page where they say what they stand for, something that they had a huge chance to push for, an unrivaled opportunity, and they didn't do it. They backed down. So let's look at some of the other things they say they stand for. Maybe we can see further into what they actually would do. So let's take a look at some of the demands here, some of the things they say they believe in. Point one, we believe that there should be certain rights which must be won and maintained. Well, rather vague, um, don't really say what those rights are, but uh, a principle which 
is so vague I'm sure even Keir Starmer would agree with it but let's look at something a little bit more specific um, the, the right to useful and satisfying work balanced with leisure to meet the needs of society again it's not something that anybody is really going to disagree with unless they're you know one of the wilder extremes of the Conservative Party or perhaps a writer for the Guardian but looking at that the right to useful and satisfying work balanced with leisure to meet the needs of society yes and the reason what it's a something which almost everybody would agree with but there's a problem with that Keir Starmer could agree with that point and probably does and certainly say that he does um, various members of the Liberal Democrats would say that they agree with that point various members of the Conservative Party would say that they agree with that point and that reveals a certain problem in something which is supposed to be a manifesto or at least a list of uh, key demands of what's supposed to be the socialist body and Labour Party they're putting out phrases and um, lists of demands that are so bland so vague so completely elastic that Tony Blair could agree with them I'm sure Tony Blair would agree with um, the idea that everybody had the rights to satisfying work his definition of satisfying work might not be yours but he could agree with the statement so let's look at another one uh, the right to a good home for all in which we live in which to live bring up children and care for dependents again something that no reasonable person could possibly disagree with but again there's a problem Keir Starmer could look at that and say he would agree with it and we're starting to see why there's a problem with putting forward these supposed demands that are so vague and so bland which is that everybody in the Labour Party would say that they agreed with that everybody from Wes Streeting all the way through to Diane Abbott and there's a reason why then if you go through the rest of the demands it's all couched in the same very vague very bland language about wanting various things that no reasonable person in this country could possibly object to and they might be doing that deliberately um, to make it make their demands appear as if it would be something that everybody would agree with but there's a problem in putting it that way and the problem is that when you're advocating as a socialist for policies for positions which are going to benefit the working class you can't put those in the bland language which would seek to have every single person in the country agree with it because that's telling something of a lie when you're putting forward and advocating for the the, the working class position you do going to run into the teeth of opposition from the rich the powerful the political establishment collectively known as the ruling class and their political representatives because whether the socialist campaign group likes to admit it or not we in this country are subjected to a class war waged by the richest against the working class and that class war goes on constantly in every workplace and community in every workplace the employers are always looking to people looking to make workers work longer for the same or less money to get less pension at the end of it to be more exploited in a short in a short phrase and if you're going to go out there advocating for what's supposedly a socialist position you need to be honest with uh, working class people and let them know that well this is what we advocate for this is how we're going to fight for it and we're going to be needing to fight for it because there is a group the rulers and the owners of this country who will stop at nothing to defend their interests and will undermine and attempt to destroy any political movement which seeks to challenge them even in the smallest way that is the lesson of Jeremy Corbyn who challenged them even in the smallest way and got completely destroyed as a result and by putting forward things which are so completely un um, bland and without any real re uh, recognition of the fact that when advocating for the demands of the working class you are going to run into this fierce and ferocious opposition from the ruling class you are essentially selling people a, a lie you are telling them that well we can we can put forward these nice things and if we just advocate for these nice things that no one could possibly disagree with and um, uh, then we will somehow get them and this is not being straight with people you have to tell people the truth which is that even if we advocate for things which are um, which 90% of the population would agree with 
or maybe even higher, maybe 95% of the population would agree with it, would agree with. Well, the people who own and control this, this, this country, the people who own all the important land, all the important industries, the people with the, who control the big banks, the big corporations, they're going to come at any government which tries to um, implement even the smallest changes on, on behalf of the working class. They're going to come at them at a, a thousand miles per hour. And they're going to kind of attempt to destroy you before you can even take one step towards getting your objectives achieved. And has the socialist campaign group learnt from the experience of Corbyn? Judging from the demands that they're putting forward, judging from their actions, it doesn't seem that they do. They're still trying to pretend that they can somehow go using the, some of the same tactics of the Corbyn era to advance the cause of socialism. Well, putting forward such, such bland and nondescript demands, um, tweeting a lot about how mean the Tories are, isn't actually pushing forward the, the fight for socialism, nor is um, the fact that none of them are actually prepared to have a serious political battle. I'll give you another example of it. Recently, just before the uh, the current uh, war in Ukraine uh, went on, went, went to another level with the uh, the entry of Russian troops into Ukraine, uh, a war which, as many of you will know, had been going on for eight years since the uh, the coup backed by the United States was staged in 2014 in Kiev. Now, before that latest phase of that war began, stop the war coalition pulled out um, a fairly innocuous anti-war statement with, to which a lot of the MPs from the socialist campaign group signed on to. Now when the uh, the war again went on to it, went on to this next level with the entry of Russian troops into it, um, the Labour Party leadership under Keir Starmer immediately started banging the war drum, started demanding that the MPs, Labour MPs who had signed this Stop the War Coalition statement repent basically that they would uh, they take their names off that statement and of course every single one of them did none of them defended even the uh, mo most basic anti-war position they immediately fell into line with the demands of Keir Starmer now this is an important thing it's a very important moment because as everybody who's been watching the events unfold in Ukraine and the reaction of the British government their constantly constant fueling of the conflict via uh, flooding Ukraine with British-made weaponry, uh, via the ba by the constant uh, backing up of the United States' very hardline position. The British government was seeking to get the entire political establishment in line behind the leadership of Boris Johnson and behind the leadership of the President of the United States, Joe Biden. And they didn't want any deviation from that. They didn't want any critical voices raised against that position. And so Keir Starmer, sorry, it's given me his proper title, Sir Keir Starmer, was being, a, as he always is, the loyal foot soldier of the establishment. He duly demanded that all of his MPs repent any um, position that had criticised NATO, that had criticised the policies of the United States or the British government, and they loyally did so. The Socialist Campaign Group rolled over com uh, without even a whimper of a fight. They then, uh, some of them at least, started um, attending rallies where they were making demands of the Russian government, not even addressing the their own government, which they might hope to have an influence over. It was a complete display of the most horrendous political cowardice, as these people always do. And this is the problem. This is a major problem when people say they are going to find another Jeremy Corbyn. They are going to have another attempt to take over the Labour Party. Well, not only when they had the chance to do it the last time around, did they completely fail and crumble at every single time they were challenged by the entrenched interests of the ruling class and the political establishment and the lies of the media. They completely surrendered to them every single time. And now, with Keir Starmer actively witch-hunting socialists out of the Labour Party, with him throwing Jeremy Corbyn out of the Parliamentary Labour Party, with Starmer relentlessly lining up behind the government on every single key position, mo and in mo most recently and most importantly over the war in Ukraine, when he demanded that the, his MPs 
get in line behind him and move away from even the most basic state anti-war statements or criticism of the British government they all loyally did so so as you can see we've got a group here which claims to advocate for socialism but makes policy statements with which Keir Starmer could happily agree we've got a group that claims to be for peace that claims to be anti-war but which capitulates when the war drums are banging the loudest when you need clear political leadership and real political courage to stand up to the war hysteria being whipped up by the Tories by the media by the wider political establishment you need a clear anti-war anti-NATO position and none of them were prepared to do that all of them rolled over and that's the ultimate test now I don't claim that these are easy things to do when the entire political establishment is screaming at you calling you everything from a traitor to um, a Putin asset a Russian stooge but that's why you're in a leadership position and an MP especially a socialist MP claiming to advocate for the working class when you're in that position you are in a leadership position it is your job to stand up and give leadership when all around you there is chaos and lies and confusion and there's all kinds of propaganda going on is it your job to stand up and actually speak to your constituents speak to the working class and give a clear position and say this is the this is what is going on this is the lie that is being told to you this is why I'm making this stand right now and why I want you to join me in doing so and they don't do any of those things they don't do anything about appealing to the working class they don't do anything about trying to explain and put across a basic anti-war position or try to explain the basic position that when you're in a when you're locked in a class war which is permanent the class war as I said earlier is always being waged by the ruling class against the working class that does not change at time of war in fact it only intensifies because the ruling class now has the chance to hide behind the the situation in wartime and say well you can't step out of line now everybody look there's a war off at that time it's even more important for supposed socialists to step forward and give a clear line of leadership to the working class and say look this is what this is what is going on this is what ne needs to happen uh, this is why we need to mobilize around this this is why our main enemy as the working class is at home it's not in Moscow it's not where the ruling class say our enemy is our enemy is the same enemy as it always is it's the rich and the powerful in this country it's their political representatives it's their constantly lying media and if you can't do that then you're certainly not going to be in a position to actually lead um, some kind of socialist government at any time in the near in the, in the near future because let's this conclude on this point we know not only from Corbyn um, what the British ruling class will do when they feel like their power is being challenged we know also from one of the founders of the socialist campaign group the late Tony Benn from when he was in government back in the 1970s at a time of much greater working class radicalism we know through his diaries when he was a cabinet minister the tricks that the ruling class and their political servants will pull to try and stymie and frustrate and thwart the policies of what was back then an elected Labour government uh, Tony Benn and his diaries from 74 to 79 when he was first uh, minister for in the Department of Trade and Industry and then energy minister was constantly writing about how the the civil service senior the senior men were blocking his policies were trying to frustrate him selling him things that selling him things couldn't be done uh, how there was constant attempts to undermine that government by the security services by MI5 including spying on the Prime Minister at the time Harold Wilson and through those diaries if you read them and they always they're very much a, a work worth reading you can see clearly that the the, to the ruling class and their political and the political establishment that represents them to the permanent bureaucracy in the senior civil service to the senior army chiefs to the intelligence men these people will stop at nothing to defend their class interests they don't care about democracy they don't care about niceties they don't care about the truth certainly and their the, 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 their prostitute press certainly doesn't care about the truth either what they care about is relentlessly defending their class interests as they understand them and they are prepared to do anything 
tell any lie, commit any act of uh, political sabotage, sabotage of the entire country, even crashing the economy, even in order to get what they want, which is to keep the working class in their place and to keep themselves at the top. Now, unless you are aware of that and are prepared to actually organize a working class movement in such a way as to be able to resist that effectively, then you are not doing anything for anybody. Then you are just wasting everybody's time, which is ultimately what the socialist campaign group are really doing. They, by putting forward these bland demands, by refusing to fight when the opportunity arises, by refusing to give clear political leadership when the opportunity arises, they are neglecting their duties as the supposed leaders of some kind of socialist movement. They are, when the pressure is on, they just follow and tail end Keir Starmer, who himself tail ends Boris Johnson. So ultimately, there is going to be no second coming of a Jeremy Corbyn type figure out of the socialist campaign group. They will barely even manage to hold on to what they've got in the Labour Party, because they're certainly not fighting against Keir Starmer's attempts to remove even the smallest trace of the smallest type of socialism from the Labour Party. So the lesson of all of this is that these, that when faced with um, a determined and relentless class war, you need to be as determined and relentless in your advocating for an organisation within the working class. And you can't have these half measures, these attempts at compromise, these attempts at um, finding a way through the establishment channels. The establishment is relentless in its defense of the interests of the rich and powerful. And unless you're prepared to be as relentless in the uh, pursuit of the interests of the British working class, then you have no business in politics. And quite frankly, yeah, these people should really be pushed out of the way if they will not get out of the way. So I hope that's been um, an illuminating uh, short journey through the politics of the Socialist Campaign Group. Um, by all means, uh, go and check out their website, go and read about the records of the people involved. Um, you, if you agree or disagree with me, please make a, make a comment in the, uh, in the area below. And thank you for watching and I'll be back with you very soon.